Okay, so we've looked at the SAP flow methods and we've looked at some equipment as well. So let's move on to some data analysis techniques. And the first one I want to touch on today is this concept of peak SAP flow. And basically what that means is that at what time of the day was maximum SAP flow? So, so in most um, trees or most plants, um, you know, SAP flow rise, rises in the morning and reaches a maximum about lunchtime or early afternoon. Um, so what we can do is we can go through our entire data set from an entire growing season or an entire calendar year, for example. And on each day throughout the year, we can note at the time of the day uh, where the maximum sap flow occurred. And then we can do a, a simple frequency diagram to come up with these graphs that you see over here. So in this example, we uh, this example comes from a publication we published a few years ago by Doralina and I. Um, so we have three different eucalypt species. We have Eucalyptus cladocalyx, Eucalyptus meliodora, and Eucalyptus polybractea. So with Eucalyptus cladocalyx, he had a, a, mainly a peak sap flow at about 1 p.m. Whereas Eucalyptus meliodora and Eucalyptus polybractea had a peak sap flow at about 10 to 11 o'clock in the morning. So even though generally a lot of plants or most plants have their peak sap flow in the middle of the day, once you start looking at the data in a bit more detail, you find that there are these different peaks. And we can then use that information to work out some what's maybe going on with other plant physiology or other plant water relations. So for example, if um, eucalyptus cladocalyx is keeping its tomato open till you know, 1 p.m. in a day, and eucalyptus meliodora and polybractea are closing their stomata at about 10 or 11 o'clock, this means that the eucalyptus meliodora and polybractea are uptaking less carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, so their photosynthesis is potentially lower, and that's going to have effects on growth rates and yield. So if you're interested in working out why a particular crop or variety is not growing as quick as another one, this is a possible technique that you can use from your sap flow data to delve into that um, a possible cause into that. A very common um, statistical technique that you see in probably just about every single sap flow paper that you read um, is a correlation that um, goes on between sap flow and vapor pressure deficit or VPD. So in this graph over here, which again comes from Doralina and Forster, um, this is a very typical graph that you might see in a sap flow publication. So you have a whole bunch of um, dots or a scatter diagram. And then you have a logistic uh, regression curve that's overlaid that data. So in this particular example, we have our three different eucalypt species and the relationship between sap flow and vapor pressure deficit. And what this shows us is, is that um, as vapor pressure deficit increases, so does sap flow. And then it reaches a certain point where um, vapor, deficit, vapor pressure deficit keeps increasing but sap flow doesn't increase as much. So the stomata start to close. Um, so it basically demonstrates that stomata close at high VPD. And you can look at that over an entire data set, or you can look at subsets of data as well. So this one comes from Fauci and Adams in 2012, where they looked at the relationship between sap flow and VPD at different parts of their growing season. And so they've applied their logistic curve, uh, found some nice hard squares, and found that the relationship between sap flow and VPD changes over the, over the growing season. Um, so yes, this does provide some very nice data, but you know, it's, it's been done in just about every paper and the relationship is known. And what we really wanna know is a bit more about the relationship between sap flow and vapor pressure deficit. So, so it's really time just to move on uh, from doing a simple logistic uh, regression or a logistic relationship and to really delve into the sap flow and vapor pressure deficit data in more detail. So one question you can ask is, is the relationship between sap flow and vapor pressure de deficit so straightforward? Um, does it actually follow a logistic uh, regression curve? So my colleagues and I in 2011, we published a paper, um, here it is here, Dersma et al in 2011. Uh, so here you can see we got, well, in this case is transpiration, but that could be sap flow and vapor pressure deficit on this axis. And then the blue dots and the red dots are our different treatments from this experiment. And you can see like the previous slide, we have a whole bunch of dots and a, a very messy scatter. 
And we could have just applied a simple um, logistic regression curve over that and found some kind of relationship. But instead what we did was we applied a generalized additive model. So a GAM model is a dynamic or an iterative model and it applies a dynamic mean and 95% confidence interval. So over here is our results from the GAM model. So the solid line is our mean and the grayed area is our 95% confidence interval. So we see that when VPD increases, SAT flow increases, but then as VPD keeps increasing, we see a complicated relationship between uh, SAT flow and VPD. And it doesn't just taper off, it actually decreases, or you have some humps as well, like here and here. Um, so the relationship isn't so straightforward. There's a lot of things going on there. By using a GAM model, we can investigate that relationship in more detail. Another way to look at your SAT flow and vapor pressure deficit data is to do what's called a breakpoint or a, a piecewise regression analysis. So what this means is that um, on our curve where we have uh, SAT flow versus VPD, we can apply two linear curves at different parts of that relationship. And where these two linear curves intersect, we call that the breakpoint. So in this example, it is there. So here's one linear curve and here's a second linear curve. And at this, this intersection point here, we call this the breakpoint. So we can note what the VPD value is at that breakpoint. And we can then use that value to learn more about plant water relations and plant water use strategies. So like I said before, as um, VPD increases, SAT flow increases, and then it starts to taper off or level off. And at that point, that's when we say stomata start to close. So your breakpoint, your VPD breakpoint tells you at what level of VPD does your stomata start to close. So when we apply that information to other uh, plant physiology um, parameters, so in this example down here, we have the um, root hydraulic conductance and your VPD breakpoint on this axis. And here we see a nice linear relationship between the two. So what this graph now tells us is, is that as the root hydraulic conductance increases, the capacity for the plant to keep its stomata open at higher VPDs also increases, um, or the, the amount of sap flow that can be undertaken before it tapers off at high VPD has increased. So we've now got more information from our vapor pressure deficit data. Uh, we can learn more about plant physiology and we can learn more about uh, water use strategies as well by doing a little bit more um, in-depth analysis. So another way to consider your vapor pressure deficit data is to, to ask the question, what is the optimal vapor pressure deficit of a species or a crop variety or, or a, a particular treatment, for example? Uh, and the way you do this is you, you measure your sap flow over one year or a growing season or some length of time. And um, to make things easy, you just remove the rain days from that data set. And then you sort your data into from the highest to lowest sap flow. And you correlate the vapor pressure deficit at that time. So you sort the data into your top 5% of um, sap flow. And the reason why we choose this top 5% because we're assuming when sap flow is at its highest, the plant is at its happiest or it's at its most optimal. So it has plenty of soil moisture, the weather's not too, not too hot or dry, um, it's got plenty of nutrients, the stomata are wide open, photosynthesis is at its, um, presumably at its highest. Uh, so that's why we choose the top 5%. It's, it's the optimal condition for that plant. So we know what the top 5% of sap flow is, and then we can correlate to what is the VPD at that time. So um, Augustine Dorolina and I, back in our 2015 paper, uh, this is exactly what we did for our three different eucalypt species. And we also did the same thing for optimal temperature. So we were interested to know in what was the optimal vapor pressure deficit and what was the optimal uh, temperature for our three different eucalypt trees. So for eucalyptus cladocalyx, the optimal VPD was 2.6 and for Meliodora, it was about two and same with Polybractea. The temperature, the optimal temperature was 26 degrees for Eucalyptus cladocalyx. It was about 24 for Meliodora and um, 23 for Polybractea. So in, in this example, we see that Eucalyptus cladocalyx can 
it is more optimal at a drier and hotter atmosphere than the other two eucalypt species. So in our particular study, we were interested in uh, mine site rehabilitation. And our study area was in a site that in the future is expected to have hotter and drier summers. So we were interested in knowing which tree could tolerate hot, dry summers. So in this example, our eucalyptus cladocalyx had a more optimal VPD and temperature condition um, at a higher VPD and temperature. So therefore, we would probably more likely plant this tree over the other two species um, in this mine site rehabilitation project. So you can you could probably see how this sort of data can be used quite nicely for say um, selecting for a crop species for tolerating hotter weather conditions for example or looking at um, you know different species tolerance to climate change or co2 or something like that for example another another data analysis technique i want to talk about is um is doing a multivariate analysis and and what you do see in many sat flow papers is a graph that looks a bit like this where you have your sat flow on the y-axis and then a whole bunch of environmental variables on the x-axis so here we have air temperature relative humidity vapor pressure deficit your wind speed and down here we have um, global radiation or the amount of sunshine and then you have these big scatters um, all over the place and and what a lot of papers do is that they go through each of these graphs and each of their treatments individually and apply a um, Pearson's correlation or get an R squared. And then they look at which Pearson's correlation has a value close to one. And they say, this is the one that is explaining most of our sat flow. Or for example, BPD is got an R squared of 0.97, whereas solar radiation has an R squared of 0.75. Therefore, VPD um, has a greater explanatory uh, factor on our data. But when you're looking at all these different environmental variables, they're, they're actually all co-varying with each other. So from a statistical point of view, it's actually more appropriate to do a multivariate analysis where you're analyzing all the variables together. So rather than analyzing one variable in isolation, you're pulling all of the variables into one model and then analyzing each variable while controlling for the other variables in that model. And one particular technique uh, which is very effective at doing this is your partial regression analysis. And another one, for example, is your, your principal components analysis. So, so there are quite a few different ones out there, but if you are going to do a whole bunch of um, correlations or regression analyses, it's always good to do some kind of multivariate analysis. So this result here, this is the result of a multivariate analysis from a, a paper I published a few years ago, um, Forster 2012. So we, we had um, our sap flow correlated against solar radiation and temperature and VPD, and, and we did find all those nice linear um, scatter graphs. But then once we put it into our multivariate model, in this case, a partial regression model, um, we got these partial regression plots on the other side of the model once we did our analysis. And you can see here that a lot of the variables, there's, there's no relationship, but for this one down here, you can just see by looking at it, there's a clear uh, positive linear relationship going on there. So we can get all these um, partial correlations or all these R values. And we find that in this case, VPD had an R value of 0.68 and the other ones um, had very low R values. And you can also do a percentage of variance explained by the model. So in our case, vapor pressure deficit explained about 47% of the variance in the model, whereas the other variables explained very, very little variance. So it's a great way to, to tease apart um, exactly which environmental variable is driving sap flow in your study. And we highly recommend doing some kind of multivariate analysis on your, on your data.